Hey guys, Jen here. Welcome to our sixth discussion of story engineering. Today we are talking about scene execution. Um, so this is the book, if anyone is just joining us now, has just found out about this event series, uh, Story Engineering, I know the image is backwards, um, Story Engineering by Larry Brooks, this is what we're talking about, we've been reading it all week and doing a discussion each day, and today is our sixth discussion. So today is a really, really exciting topic, I say, because everything we've talked about up to this point has been very um, theory-based, so it's very much this is like the theory on the principles of writing a really good story. And now we're getting into the actual, this is how you execute on this theory and all these other principles and things we've been talking about. So it's really um, the hit the ground running with planning and developing your story more than just the thinking through it and get, getting the ideas, but really, okay, this is how we take all of that stuff we just worked on and developed and use it to actually create something specific that we use in our story aka a scene. So scenes are really the building blocks of your entire story. It's the thing that not only connects all of your plot points together, but then also, you know, gives us the most important information and gives us the, um, you know, what we need to really pace through our story and to keep a reader hooked from start to finish. So again, just going to dive right in. And if anyone is here, wants to say hi, so that I know you're here, say hi in the comments and um, that'd be awesome. Okay, so I thought to start, I would read this little, little section on page 228 that Larry mentioned in Story Engineering that I think just really, if you, you know, take nothing else away from this, it's this, the thing that can really change everything for your story as far as how your scenes get executed and all of that. Because without this, you're going to have a serious issue with um, making your story work. So... Okay, the paragraphs that I'm going to read talk about the idea of you have a blueprint, right? So you've planned out your story, you've developed it, you sort of know what your structure is and all the, you know, structure points. You've figured out your concept, you've got your plot, all of that stuff. Well, that's not enough. And this is, you know, going to kind of jump us into our discussion today. So in Story Engineering, he says, to accomplish all of this post-blueprint work, so again, meaning if you had, you know, planned out your story and developed the idea and everything, and now you have a structural blueprint of what you're going to do, you have but one primary tool in your toolbox of literary assets, scenes. Sure, you've got ideas and you've got a huge pile of words ready to go, but none of that means a thing at this point without scenes. Scenes are what you use to hammer your story home. You may think that words are your primary storytelling tools, but they're actually more like paint and plaster rendered onto an infrastructure that won't crumble under its own weight. If your conceptual idea is weak, your character less than compelling, your theme flat or missing altogether, and if it's all in the wrong order, Shakespeare himself on his very best day can't save you, at least until the broken infrastructure has been fixed. And for that, you need a story architect, not a wordsmith. You must be both. And... I would say those last four words are probably the most important. You must be both. So you can't just be someone who knows how to write really good prose. And you can't just be someone who knows how to develop a story idea. You have to be both. You have to be able to craft really compelling scenes, really compelling story. And you have to be able to have the right words to make it compelling. And not just the information is compelling, but the actual wording and how you've written it is compelling as well. So you really have to have both of those things. And I thought that was just such a really good way of saying it and really um, a good way of explaining why it's so important to not only master craft and understand structure and how it all works, but also to practice writing as much as you can. Because when you, you know, have both of those things, it makes a big difference. And one thing I always say is that I'm not the greatest prose writer yet. Like I'm working on it, it's something that I, you know, it's a skill I've had and I'm working on every time I write something, I feel like it gets better and better. But I feel like my core um, skill set is that I'm a storyteller. I know how to tell a good story. I know what's compelling. I know um, what isn't compelling. And I know how to execute it in a way that actually keeps a reader hooked and engaged. So all of that to me is more important than being the best writer ever because I know that I can revise my words. And then, of course, I have an editor who looks at it who gives me ideas on how to add more characterization and layer in more setting and description. But none of that matters if you don't have a good story and you don't know how to tell a compelling story. So being able to do both is, you know, the goal that you're going to have as a writer and in your writing career from here on out is being able to write well, but also having a compelling, you know, ability to tell stories. 
So going through some of the specifics of what a scene is and all of that. So Larry mentions that a story should have anywhere from 40 to 70 scenes. So this is going to be based on the story, obviously. So some stories have more than that. Some have, you know, around 40. It's really up to, you know, you as the storyteller now to decide what do I need specifically to connect these plot points to um, bring the story to life. You know, this is, I would say, probably in the scene execution and, you know, executing on all of these parts that we've been talking about, this is where your story sense is going to come through the most because this is when you're either going to nail it, you're going to know what to do, you're going to have it, you know, executed properly or you're not. So your story sense is going to be super important here. And that's why I say as much as you possibly can, watch movies, read books, and don't just watch them or read them, but do it analytically. So do it with the, the question in mind of what is happening in this scene? What is the purpose of it? And how is it moving the story forward? How is it adding to the story? Um, what's the piece of information that's coming into this story? It's more than just two characters talking. There's actually something happening here. And what is it? So studying that and watching how did they connect the plot points and how did you know they lead up to the plot point and away from the plot point it's so important to do that because this is going to help with your story sense and understanding what it really takes to put a story together and not just making guesses. So when I was writing my first novel in 2008, I was making guesses mostly because I didn't know a lot about how to write a, you know, a proper scene. So I sat down and started writing. Well, some of my scenes actually added to the story, actually moved the story forward. But a bunch of the ones that connected those important scenes were just nonsense. They were just characterization or setting or you know, just me not knowing what to do. So I made the character go have dinner or I made her, you know, go to a bar and have a drink with a friend. Things that you might think people do on an everyday basis, but this isn't an everyday episodic tale. This is a specific story with a specific goal and a mission and each scene needs to move us toward that. So going through some of the criteria that Larry talked about in story engineering, um, he mentions that each individual scene is like a one act play in some ways. So it has potentially a beginning, a middle and an end. Now, That doesn't mean you have to show all of that to us. I mean, maybe you do, depends on your story, but you have to know that in that scene, there is a beginning, middle, and end. And maybe we only get the middle to the end. Maybe we just get the end, or maybe we need the whole thing. It's going to depend on your story. And again, this comes down to story sense. So knowing how late into the scene can I jump without losing anything, and while it still adds value, makes sense, and moves the story forward. So don't start too early. Don't start too late. You know, what's that really um, balanced time right in between there? So think of each scene like that. The other thing is to think about is the fact that a scene is a building block for a bigger thing. So imagine this like Legos or something. You know, you might have all these different pieces of your Legos and, um, you know, I don't know if you played with Legos as a kid or if your kids play with Legos, but, um, you know, that was something I always enjoyed doing. And it was because you get to take these random pieces, these puzzle pieces, and really put them together into one solid thing that's, you know, a house or a, a building or whatever it is you're, you know, creating with those Legos. So, it's really helping you to um, build on it. So each of those Legos is its own little unit of, you know, scene, let's say, and it builds on it so that by the end you have a full completed something, whether that's a building or, you know, a book, etc. So, you know, think of your scenes as little tiny units of story, but they add together to create a bigger story as a whole. So one scene is not enough for the whole story. One scene couldn't tell us everything we need to know in order for that story to, you know, make sense, which is why we have multiple. Uh, Okay, so another criteria is that a scene must present a dramatic scenario with um, something at stake. So there should be an outcome of some kind. There should be some sort of a, um, you know, something that comes into play here that's going to be important for the story. It's not just giving us characterization. It's not just giving us information about the setting or, you know, giving us a backstory of this character. We're actually getting something important that's going to move the story forward or that's giving us new information that's going to now um, connect to something else that's already been going on. Let's see, I've got a couple of comments. I just want to check real quick. Larry says, um, good morning here, afternoon, in and out too, or at least out early. Family here, got to help with with brunch. Awesome. Um, No problem. We're happy to have you on here for as much as we possibly can, so thank you for being here. Um, Janet, I have a decent first draft completed, but need to ensure I have a strong character arc. I already know there's a number of weak spots. Can I revise scene by scene according to the checklist and add in character as I go, or is it better to draft out character arc as second draft and go through the story again, making sure each scene is strong? All right, let's see. I think Larry just responded to that. Um, Janet, whatever you do, use the context of the big picture flow of the story to drive the revision. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say it's very difficult, I think, to go back through a story that doesn't have all the pieces, that doesn't necessarily work cohesively, and try to retrofit things into it. I think it makes more sense to sort of set that aside, start a new version, using the stuff that you've now come up with, using the new character arc and all of that, and then looking back at what you've already done and saying, okay, of what I have from this draft, what actually works now, what actually fits into the new version, the right version, and then move it from there. And if it doesn't fit, then, you know, this is the time to get rid of it. So um, that's how I do my revisions is I will write the draft and then I start a brand new document where I actually, and I use Scrivener, so I start a new Scrivener project. And then I'll actually go through and any new stuff I've added, of course, I have written down in my um, post-draft beat sheet that I've done. But I definitely will go back through my original version and say, okay, what of this can I move? What scenes are staying? Um, which ones am I using a chunk of that scene? So as I go back through and rewrite the scenes or re, you know, um, just rework everything, I'm moving stuff over from the original version. So that always helps me to sort of keep it separate and then also to have the original version saved just in case I ever decide I want to go back and grab something or use something or, you know, whatever. So that's how I like to do it. Um, Larry says, most important thing, my opinion, about scene writing, the author understands the purpose of the scene, its mission, and the precise expo expositional ad that moves the story forward with characterization. No ad, no scene. This allows us to enter the scene at the last possible moment. Advice from William Goldman. Yes, awesome. And that's something I think that goes right into this criteria of a scene. So, um, you know, to quote Larry from Story Engineering, he says, if your scenes aren't effective, no matter how pretty your words, the story will tank. So it's not just about, oh, I'm going to make this really pretty scene that gives us, you know, setting and characterization and description and all that, but it's about what does this add to the story? Does this have any information or anything that's going to get us to the next scene, that's going to compel us to keep reading forward and keep watching, or are we just going to close the book now and walk away? And that's really, I think, the biggest thing is making sure you're keeping your reader interested in the story and keeping them hooked. And that's what scene writing is all about. So um, what is a scene? And that's, I think, a question a lot of writers have. And we sort of, you know, aren't really sure how to describe it. So in story engineering, I quoted this because, I, again, I just think that it's so much clearer when you can kind of pull these little pieces out. So he says, a scene is a unit of dramatic action or exposition, which includes narrative review, overview, or connective tissue that stands alone in location and time. So there's another key distinction there, which is location and time. So when you have a change of location or a change of time, even if it's a jumping ahead 10 minutes, even if it's, you know, um, a person walking from one building to the next building, that is a change of location or time that is going to cause a new scene to come into play. And so a lot of things what I see with writers is they'll, you know, send me scenes to look at for their stories and it's like, five things in one scene and it's we can see that there's been uh time changes there's been location changes but they think that it all goes into one scene because they've been told that a scene has to be really long or it has to have you know characterization and dialogue and all this stuff so you know it's sort of a, a miss um miss focus really because it's that's not what it is it's it's more than that so thinking about it from each individual beat of a scene so what is the information that i'm giving here that's going to move the story forward starting with that and then from there, building in the characterization, the dialogue, the description, the narration, you know, all that stuff that fits to support that piece of information and helping to, you know, bring it to life in that scene. So, uh, let's see, we got some more comments. Um, Larry says, many writers and guru types advocate a just right approach. Spill it onto the page, then fix it. I don't complete ascribe. I don't completely ascribe, but whatever works, works. That said, the more we know about the principles as we just write, the less of a mess it will be. Exactly. Um, Janet, thanks for mentioning beat sheets. I use them to create my story. I'll go back to them and ensure character arc is there properly and then write great advice. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Glad to have you found that clarity because I feel like that's really the purpose of all of this discussion. So it's not just to you know give information and to teach you something, which obviously that's part of it, but it's also to illuminate um, what you really need to know in order to build a good story. So it's, it's getting these epiphanies and these little aha moments from what we're talking about that's going to really change the direction of your, you know, your story, your writing career. For me, you know, it's always been about the little epiphanies, little things that I learned along the way that felt like, oh, like that's why it hasn't been working. Okay, I need to now use this and to pivot in that direction. So um, that's been true for me of things in my life and also in my writing 
and in my storytelling. So um, for me, like I said, structure was a pivotal moment. It changed everything. Um, and now, you know, I'm where I'm at because I learned and mastered structure. So um, just keep at it and keep learning this stuff because the more you do, the better you're going to get at things and the more clarity you're going to have on how to actually execute on your own stories. Okay, so scenes are really where your story comes to life. And it's really, you know, again, I think that story sense is the the perfect way to describe what scene execution is all about. It's all about your story sense, it's understanding how stories work, how they come, you know, how they come together. And so that's something to keep in mind. But out of all the stuff that we read for today in that section about story and I mean scene execution, excuse me, um, I would say there was one thing that stands out out of all of it. And it, I would love to know if you also felt this way that it stood out for you is that scenes should be mission driven. So, and I mentioned this earlier in our live stream discussions this week, but um, that's the whole idea. It's mission driven. So you're not just having a scene that gives us characterization, that gives us setting. You're giving us something that actually adds to the story and moves it forward in some way. Um, a decision, like, so this is directly from Larry now, a decision, an action, new information, a change of some kind, forward motion. So that's mission driven storytelling. Um, that's not just giving us characterization. Now, of course, that's mixed into it. So it's not just about, you know, oh, I'm going to give this little bit of info, but it's layering it in with, okay, what needs to be in the scene to support that info? So we have to have some dialogue. We're going to have to have some characters. Uh, we're probably going to have to learn a little bit about these characters in order for it to make sense. So it's it's mission driven to making sure that you actually have a purpose, but then you are layering in all the other pieces that are going to support that purpose and moving the story forward. Larry says, Little Epiphany is a great title for a writing book. Yeah, that is a great title. Uh, mission driven b both for scenes and for macro story design over four parts. Yeah, exactly. Because again, as we talked about over the last couple of days with structure with the um, four parts of story, that's all mission driven as well. Mission meaning it has a context. It has a purpose to fulfill. And that's the whole idea is that, you know, part one is setup and part two is reaction and part three is attack. Part four is resolution. So it's moving us through the story and each of the missions of those parts. Janet says, the thing that stood out for me was the line, you need to know the scene's sweet spot. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, again, everyone's going to take away something different from the reading. So I think that's why it's cool to talk about it because it sort of um, brings to light all the different things. So um, I've read this section a few times and I don't even remember that sentence. So see what I mean when I say like we all take away something that we really need for our storytelling. And so um, that's great that that's what stood out for you. For me, when I was learning about this stuff originally, you know, back five, six years ago, the mission driven was really that thing that stood out to me was, okay, I never thought about it that way. So now knowing that I could look back at the draft I'd written in 2008 and know right away, okay, well, half these scenes have no mission. They don't do anything for the story. So it almost gives you that, that sense and that criteria for, well, this doesn't work. And now you know what does work or you know what you have to do because you now understand that it's mission driven. So let's see, I've got a whole bunch of notes on the scene. So I just want to make sure I cover everything because I think a lot of it is really, really relevant. So, um, so, oh, here, here's another really good quote from Larry. So he said, a scene should move the story forward, not take a snapshot of it. So, um, perfect way of talking about exactly what I was just saying. So I see so many writers, I mean, I read a lot of people's drafts and, um, I work with a lot of writers and their stories. And a lot of the times what I see is, we have scenes that are just giving us backstory or just giving us characterization. And in that way, it's giving us a snapshot, like Larry's saying. It's it's not moving the story forward. It's just giving us a snapshot that says, this is the scene right now. It's almost like taking a picture of it, but we're not moving anywhere. It's not like a video where the video is actually moving us somewhere. Um, it's just a solid snapshot. So you want to avoid that and you want to look at each of the scenes you've come up with and ask yourself, is this a snapshot of the scene or is this actually adding something? Is it moving the story forward? Uh, let's see. Eliza, will this video be up later for rewatching? My internet is terrible right now and it keeps buffering. I would love to see this. Yes. So once these videos are done being live, they automatically get posted back to my Facebook page. So you can definitely um, go and, and find it there. Um, I send them out to my email list. So if you're not already on my email list, if you go to my website, I have a free ebook you can grab and sign up to get the ebook and then the email list will automatically, you know, you'll automatically be subscribed and then tomorrow you'll get the link from today's video and all the information about the stuff going on um, for tomorrow's live call and all of that. All right, so I like to think of 
the idea of mission-driven storytelling as what I call momentum. So story momentum. So for me, I'm always looking at, is this building to the next thing? So you want to think of your story as it's, it's building us, it's taking us somewhere. So whether that's, you know, up to a plot point or whether it's away from a plot point to the next one, um, you know, again, it's, it's all a momentum that you build based on how you execute your scenes. And momentum also comes from, are you showing us the most important information and not too much of it? So a lot of times, if you find that a scene is really slow, it's because it's probably got way too much going on. So it's too long. There's too much description, too much narrative. We're not getting, we're sort of losing the purpose of the scene because everything else is just drowning it out. And that's why, and Larry talked about this in story engineering, is you got to have a balance. So you have to have a balance of longer scenes and shorter scenes. So that way you're not necessarily just having, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages where we're just getting dialogue. We're just getting description, but we're not getting anything that actually adds to the story and moves it forward. That piece of information that we want in every scene. And ideally, he says in here, we want one piece of information or action, or decision, or, um, you know, forward motion change from each scene, ideally. Now, that's not to say it can't work without that, but I think I like that idea because I think it gives you a very clear, um, specific way of figuring out your scenes now is going, okay, what is that one piece of information that's going in this scene? And then really also boiling it down to what information do I actually need for my scenes? Because so much as the author of a story you have spent so much time developing this world and these characters and the storyline and their backstories and all this stuff. So it's hard to know, okay, what of all of this do I actually need? Which is why it's so good to look at the, you know, the mission and say, okay, what is the one piece of information going in this that's going to move the story forward? And then from there, again, looking for the supporting players, the backstory that needs to be there to explain it, the characterization we need to see to understand this, you know, the character or whatever. So layering that stuff in based on the information that's going to go in that scene. Or at least that's how I like to figure out mine. So um, the characterization and setting is not narrative. And that was, you know, again, that was another point that I wrote down from story engineering is that it's not, it's not um, narrative. It's just setting. It's just characterization. And there has to be more than that. So um, the other thing I liked is, and this is something that I I think writers get very frustrated with is the idea of flashbacks. So a lot of times with newer writers or um, like beginning scenes, uh, I see a lot of flashbacks. So they think like, oh, the only way to get the backstory in is to give us a flashback. Um, and I always say flashback is your best, better not use it if you can help it um, because it doesn't usually add to the story because it's just giving us something backstory or information from the past that maybe doesn't really need to be there. So I always say if that's the only purpose of your flashback, you're going to want to um, not use it and find another way to weave that information into a scene that's happening now. Um, but Larry had mentioned flashback, and this is, I think, a good point to sort of be a criteria for when you use flashback and when you don't use it. So he mentions um, that flashback must move the story forward, even if it's just giving the um, reader a new understanding of what's happening or what's going on. So, um, for example, in the movie Safe Haven, which I mentioned yesterday, um, and again, this is the movie version. There is a book version, but the book is slightly different than the movie. Um, so in the movie version, we get a midpoint that's a flashback. We get this, it's sort of a long, like I would say three to four, um, like cut together scenes flashback of this girl's life. And we sort of see this relationship she had with this guy. And we realize that this guy that's been chasing her all this time, who's a police officer. So we thought she broke the law. We thought she did something wrong up to this point in the story we find out that it's actually her husband and he is an alcoholic. He abuses her and she ran away from it. And so now we've got that information from a flashback at the midpoint. So even though it's a flashback scene, it adds so much to the story and it gives us a huge story milestone because it's giving us the information that was missing all the way up to that point. So we had judgments about this character. We had ideas of what her problem was, what we didn't really know. And then at the midpoint, that flashback came and told us what the problem is and what was going on. So she wasn't a criminal. She didn't do anything wrong. She was actually running away from a bad situation. And her husband was a cop, so he could manipulate the law and change things so that it looked like she had done something wrong when she had it. So um, that gave us a lot of clarity into the character, into the situation at hand, into the story. And so that's a good use of flashback. And that's when flashback is actually valuable. But it doesn't work when it's just there to give us someone's backstory. So if that was just giving us backstory about her husband and it didn't actually, you know, it hadn't been built up the way it had, 
so that it was actually revealing something new that was significant to the story. But if they had just given it to us in the beginning as flashback, well, that wouldn't work as good. So that's the whole reason, you know, to think about flashback in that sense. Does this actually add something and move the story forward, even though it's giving us a look at something that happened previously? Larry, this momentum point is huge. Static snapshot narrative is a story killer, one newer writers too often fall into without even knowing. They are writing about something so it feels good, but rather we need to write about something happening. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the point I was making with the momentum is that it's not just about this is, you know, a character's day-to-day scene, but this is, okay, this is what happened in that day-to-day moment of this character's life. Uh, flashback and backstory risky, like playing with knives, a purpose, but a potential blood lettering, <laughs> blood letting, sorry. Um, yeah. So that's the whole point. That's the whole idea with flashback and with all of that. And then the other thing he mentioned, which I thought was really important to point out is that you only want to go into descriptive detail in a scene on something when the specifics serve characterization or they impart meaning, nuance, or new content into the unfolding scene or the larger story. So Meaning that you're not just describing a bunch of shit just to describe it. You're describing something because it's going to come into play later or it's adding characterization to the story. It's not just, oh, this is an interesting. I want to sort of give us a bunch of description about something that doesn't really need to be there. So, yeah, set the scene. Maybe we need to see it. Like he had mentioned an example. If you're on the streets of Japan, maybe you want to describe the smell of fish in the air, but you don't want to make the scene all about that smell or those fish because it has nothing to do with it. So it's it's a mention, it's a little descriptive thing to give us some you know grounding in the place that we're at in the setting and, and sort of all the senses, but it's not giving us a ton of you know description on these dead fish and the smell if they don't actually add anything to the story. So I also love that, you know, sort of using that little tip as a criteria for looking at a scene and saying, okay, am I describing the wrong things here? Am I describing things that don't need to be described as much? Or am I giving detail about the wrong things? Are there things I should be giving detail about that I'm not because that actually adds to the story? So using that as sort of, um, again, a criteria that you can measure when you're looking at your scenes that you've already written or even looking to get ready to write a scene and say, what should I be describing in this scene? So Larry gave us some really cool, and I'm going to kind of go through this technique that he talks about in this section. So it's called the cut and thrust technique, and it's basically the idea that writing scenes, um, you want to write scenes that propel the reader into the next scene with a sense of urgency or anticipation. And he also goes in to say that that means the ending of the scene has to be some sort of a a thing that makes the character want or makes the reader want to turn the page and continue on with the character. So it's a hook of some kind or a cliffhanger of some kind. Maybe it opens with a qu- it leaves some sort of a question. But um, he mentioned that the final line or paragraph of that you know scene will introduce a moment of surprise, new information, something unexpected, something compelling that causes the reader to be like, I have to keep going. I can't put the book down. And um, that for me is actually something that I am really good at. I've actually because from a young age, I read a lot of books and I read um, and I wrote a lot. So I have had a lot of practice with the idea of cutting the scene off at the time where you're going to want to turn the page. And that was one of the things, thankfully, when I gave my beta readers in my novel and when I actually published it, um, that was one of the biggest things people would say to me was that they couldn't put the book down. Like they kept, even though they're like, oh, I'm tired, I need to go to bed. And one of my girlfriends was like, man, I kept wanting to put the freaking book down because I had other stuff to do. And she's like, and I couldn't. And I ended up sitting there the rest of the afternoon because I needed to finish it. Because every time the scene ended, you left me with something that made me have to turn the page and see what happened next. So it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's something that takes practice to do, but it's a really fun way of keeping your reader hooked. It's a good way to build the pacing of your story, to really have it so that every scene ends with some sort of a cliffhanger or some sort of a hook that says, well, now I need to know what happens next. And Larry described this technique a lot more in this section, so if you want to actually go back through, he gave an example of from one of his stories of how this works. But you can really see it in pretty much any movie that you read. Um, a lot of books as well, um, same thing. You're going to get that ending of the scene where you got to keep going. You have to find out what happens next because it brought up a question. It brought up some new information or it introduced something that just made you go like, whoa, I need to see what happens now. Like That's the whole idea of the whole, you know, the cut and thrust technique idea. So... That's one of the ways I love to write. I didn't even know that it was called that. I've just sort of been doing that for my whole life because I just remembered from a you know young age, the fiction classes I'd taken that the teachers would say, you have to leave with a cliffhanger. You have to leave your, your reader with a cliffhanger. The last, you know, the last paragraph of your 
your chapter or your scene should be a cliffhanger that makes you want to go to the next one. And especially this is true for chapters. So I would say, um, and I would love to sort of hear from you guys on this one. Um, do you prefer stories where the chapter is one scene and then it starts the next chapter? Or do you prefer stories, or do you write stories rather, either way, prefer or write, um, where you've got multiple scenes into each chapter? And there is no right or wrong on this. It's really however you prefer to do it and really what works best for the story. Um, I really like to have multiple scenes in my chapters so that I can really end the chapter with a very strong cliffhanger and hook that makes you want to go to the next chapter. That's, um, that's like I said, something that I remembered learning from a very young age, so it's something I've practiced a lot and I'm actually pretty good at. So um, for me, that's actually a strong point, but that's why I know like I can't, um, I got to have multiple scenes in my chapters for that reason, because I like having that sort of technique. Um, but that's not the case for everything. So I've seen a lot of stories where each scene is its own chapter. So you might get a 78 chapters and each one is a scene. So it's totally up to you how to do this. I, again, when I'm writing my draft, I don't try to figure out scenes specifically. I just write, or sorry, I don't figure out the chapters specifically. I got all the scenes, I write all the scenes out, and then when I go back through revision, that's when I divide the chapters up because that's when I can really see, okay, this is what's ending this scene or this is what's ending this. And if I feel like it's a big enough hook or cliffhanger to move to the next thing, then I stop and I say, this is the chapter break. So then, you know, it sort of gives you like a stopping point, but it also gives you that I've got to turn the page and keep going. And for me, that's just how I like to look at it. Um, let's see, we got some comments coming in here. Uh, Kimberly, I've always wondered about description of what characters are wearing. A lot of times I can't figure out how to how it moves the story forward. I don't think it really does. I mean, I think it depends on the type of fiction you're writing. So like, for example, I read a lot of chiclet um, and in chiclet, a lot of times they talk about fashion. They explain like what the people are wearing, especially like, for example, one of my favorite series is the Shopaholic series. And there's like eight or nine books at this point. And the character is very into fashion. So in every scene or every few scenes, she's describing her outfits. But it's just like a quick thing. It's not like we're getting pages and pages of what this character is wearing. It's just this is, you know, um, a quick description of the brands she has on or something. And again, this is very specific to that story. So it probably wouldn't work in another story. It's just because we know the character is into fashion and, you know, she's a shopaholic and all of that. It works really well to have that. And the readers of that type of fiction are looking for descriptions like that because that's that's chiclet. I mean, that's how kind of, you know, chiclet books unfold a lot of times is they have that kind of description. But it doesn't work in everything. So imagine the Da Vinci Code Imagine, you know, Dan Brown had described every outfit that people were wearing. That would be ridiculous. It wouldn't wouldn't fit the story. It wouldn't fit the tone. It wouldn't fit the genre. Um, you know, so I think that's really the question there is, does it fit with the story? Does it fit with the genre? And if it does, then maybe it's okay. But if it doesn't, then you probably don't need it. Uh, let's see. Janet, is foreshadowing enough to end a scene with tension? Um, I'm not sure what you mean is it is foreshadowing enough to end the scene. So you do mean like if you would end the scene on something that foreshadows something coming? Um, I mean, it could potentially be. Again, this is, there's no right or wrong answers here. This is all story sense. So this is, um, do I have enough information about what a scene is and how it works? Have I studied enough stories to watch how other people have done it to know whether or not this will work? Or just try it out and see what happens. So maybe end the scene with the foreshadowing and then see, did it work? Or does it feel like it's just not enough of a hook or it's not enough of a cliffhanger? Um, that kind of thing. So that's really what it comes down to. I, I don't think I could give you a, you know, a concrete answer on that. Julie, I always struggle to know whether a chapter is the right length. I prefer one scene per chapter so they can vary a lot in length. Yeah, I mean, this was something that Larry talked about in story engineering is that you want to have a combination of short and long scenes. So scenes that are quick hit, so sort of just give us a cut of something quick, and then longer scenes that are more descriptive. A lot of times he mentioned the longer scenes are like plot point scenes. So when you're getting your actual plot point moments, those scenes are sometimes longer because they're going to you know, be more impactful on the story. Um, and then some of the other ones can be shorter. But you definitely want to have both because it's a flow. All long scenes are going to draw the story out and make it really a, like longer than it needs to be. Too short and you're not giving us enough information to keep us interested. We're sort of just feeling like it's too all over the place. It's too random. Whereas if you have a mix where it's longer scene, shorter scene, then, you know, you sort of have this flow. And again, this is story sense. So you can't know ahead of time the scene has to be long or it has to be short. It's really up to what's happening in the scene, what information is going in it, you know, um, how soon into the scene are you starting and all that stuff. So, um, so again, it's up to you to decide 
if you think one scene per chapter works or if you want multiple scenes in a chapter. And again, there isn't a right or wrong answer. It's done both ways today. So it's, it's completely up to you and your story sense to decide that. Hope, I like at least two to three scenes in a chapter and end the chapter with a hook. Yes, that, that's exactly what I like too. So I write like that because that's the kind of stuff I like to read. Um, but again, it's, that's just my personal taste and my personal um, opinion. So uh, everybody has theirs that they enjoy. And that's the whole point of writing stories is that we, you know, find the ones that work for us that we enjoy and then we read those. Larry, clothing, quick hit, and for a reason. Well, we, we all know what a leather jacket looks like. No need to describe one unless there is. Right. So that's exactly what I was meaning. So like sometimes it's needed and sometimes it's not. Like sometimes it doesn't really matter and sometimes it does. So Again, story sense. It's up to you to decide. Does this have to be described? And going back to that thing I mentioned before, and I'll just get the actual description, you only go in, this is again quoting from story engineering, you only go into descriptive detail when the specifics serve characterization or they impart meaning, nuance, or content into the unfolding scene or the larger story. So again, using that as criteria and then ask yourself, do I need to describe the clothes? I mean, I would say that's probably the best way. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Larry says either way works. Your story sense drives this type of decision. Exactly. Exactly. Story sense is, and Julie says story sense is my new mantra now. Yeah, that's awesome. It is because again, there is principle, there's theory to story. We talked about a lot of it this week as we've gone through the sections of story engineering and going through the six core competencies. But remembering that the first four of those are, um, principles of storytelling and, you know, the last two are executional. So these are the actual, you take these principles, you take these um, criteria for what a good story is, and then this is how you actually execute it using these other ones. So scene being one of those executional pieces, which of course, anything executional is always going to come down to story sense. And anything you implement in the story, again, is going to come down to that as well. All right. So that is what I have on scenes. I wanted to just mention again quickly that if you haven't already read this section on scenes, please read it because it seriously will empower your story. It will empower your um, writing process and make a huge difference. Also on page 243 of Story Engineering, Larry gives us a really, really great checklist that we can use as you write your scenes or as you plan them out or going back through a revise, you know, a scene you've already written and revising it, looking at the checklist and asking yourself, does the scene do all of these things? Because I think criteria is really so important when it comes to actually implementing. And I think that's the reason why I've had the most success using Larry's version of all of this because I feel like he doesn't just tell you what you need to know. He goes into the specifics of what is the criteria for it. So it's not just, yeah, you got to know how to write scenes, which is like what everyone else talks about. Oh, yeah, you got to have scenes. They have to have beginning, middle, and end or whatever. But Larry actually says, here are specific criterias you can use to develop a scene. And I think that for me has been the biggest difference and why I've resonated so much with his work is because that to me is genius. It helps me to understand right away whether or not something I'm doing is working. It helps me know right away what needs to happen in the story because it gives me criteria for it. So it's not just, oh, I'm going to write a scene where my character goes to eat dinner with her friend. Well, no, if that doesn't do anything for the story, if it doesn't fit the criteria, then I don't use it. It doesn't go in anymore. So that's the you know 2008 storytelling version of me versus the version of me now, which maybe does way more planning and thinks about things way more than I used to but also makes a huge difference in the type of story that I write and in the you know fact that it's actually a good story. It's cohesive, it flows, it's engaging, it's you know a, a, something a reader is actually going to enjoy. So that's the whole thing is regardless of what process you use, regardless of how you execute on all this stuff, you always have to be thinking about your reader at the end. Is this something my reader in my genre that I'm writing for, is this something they're going to like, something they're going to enjoy and read? Not just something you think is interesting, but something that they will as well. Um, okay, Larry says, story sense in context to a full understanding of the principles versus an assumption of that understanding. Every new writer believes they know what they need to know to some risky extent. Yeah, I mean, that was true for me, absolutely. So I, like I said, I started writing from a very young age, 11, 12 years old, I was writing short stories and novellas. And to me, I had read so many books, I just thought I knew what I was doing. And like, yeah, I sort of had an idea that I knew there had to be three things, three major points that happened that changed the story direction, but I didn't know enough about craft. I couldn't have explained it. I couldn't have taught, you know, told you how I knew that it had to have those things, which is really dangerous because, again, you can't replicate it. If you don't understand it, it's impossible to replicate it. 
So you might accidentally get it right the first time, but then how the hell are you going to replicate it afterward? And that's what matters. So once I learned all that, you know, 13 years later, when I finally accepted that I didn't know what I was doing and that I couldn't just look at books and say, oh, because they wrote a good book, I can write one too. No, you got to know what they did to make it a good story. So then I learned all that. And now, of course, it changed everything because now I know that what I did back then was never going to work. And now I know what to do now to make sure that it does. So for me, um, you know, obviously developing the story sense based on, you know, understanding all the storytelling principles and all of that is what changed everything. Julie, I started working through the checklist this morning and it was incredibly helpful. I know now why you return to this book every year. I'm so glad I found it. Yes, exactly. So like I said, I probably, I found this book from Larry. So back in 2009, he had an ebook on his website that came out, you know, at the end of that year called Story Structure Demystified. And it was all about story structure and how it works and explained everything. And I was lucky enough to find that book when it first came out. I was actually a beta reader for it. So I got to read it before it was even published. And eventually that book became one of several that he had written that got put together into what is now Story Engineering that Writer's Digest published about a year after the fact. So um, so yeah, even though I've read this a million times and I read it every year, sometimes multiple times a year, um, even going through it this week with you guys and really reading it with you and making notes to talk about things, it really helped me to just ground even more in some of these principles and some of the understandings. And I feel like I took away from this week um, theme and scene specifically. Uh, so very, imprim- you know, just like very um, a new epiphany, I think, of those two things as I've talked about them with you, as I've read through the sections again. So it, it's definitely something that I highly recommend you go back to because there's so much in here and it's a lot to take in the first time you go through it, which is also why it's cool to have these discussions because it kind of breaks up the sections. But I love just having um, the ability to go back to it and know that it's it's a craft book that if I got rid of every other book that I owned, I would never ever give up this book. So um, yeah, definitely I think it's great to go back to it every year. Um, Hope, do you create a scene list in Scrivener? Have you ever created a scene list on an Excel spreadsheet? I don't like Excel, honestly, only because... I hate that you can't see everything in one screen. And if you try to make it one screen, it's so freaking tiny, you can't see it. So for me, I do all my planning by hand. I actually write out, um, I get like a notebook paper or a notebook and I write everything out by hand. I use index cards. So each scene has its own index card. Um, I actually build my scenes in Scrivener like that too. So each um, document or rather I have a document in each like little, I don't know what you call it, like a file in the document is one scene. So I'm building my whole thing out based on that. And then I write each one that way as well, which is cool because you can skip around. You don't have to go in order because you've got them all in there and you can say, okay, well, I'm going to go here now. I'm going to go here now. Um, I just prefer that because sometimes I don't want to write linearly. And sometimes I've got like two or three scenes that I've had in my head for a really long time and I just want to write them out. So um, planning out ahead of time, you know, you know what scenes you have and where they're all going. So you could jump around if you wanted to. Hope says, I hear some authors use index cards. Yeah. So for me, My index cards come during my revisions. So I actually plan my story on paper in my journal, in my notebook or whatever for the first version. So when I I set it up in Scrivener and then from there I actually write the draft. Then when I go back for revision, I go back through. I actually do a whole other beat sheet. I do, um, and again, a lot of it's just transferring what I already had, but I'm making changes as I go. And so I create a new beat sheet because I just like that clean look on the page and not have all these notes everywhere but this is just my um control freak obsessive like compulsive thing that I do but it's for me it just makes it easier to pay attention to keep everything clear and all that but I like to build the scene cards for um my revision so that I go back through and then I'm as I'm rewriting the scenes I'm going through each of the index cards so like actually physical index cards Um, Jenny, Jen, this was excellent. Thanks to you and Larry. I can't tell you how much the book and webinars have helped me understand story structure. Awesome. Yes. That is my mission to get you to understand this stuff so you can use it in your stories. Um, again, because it changed my life so much and I just, I want it to change yours as much as it did because this is going to open up an entire new world for you as far as publishing goes, as far as gaining a readership. I mean, all of it. So it's, it's massive. Um, Laura, hope you can use the corkboard features in Scrivener to make virtual index cards. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't want to do it by hand, you want to do it digitally, that Scrivener is amazing. I use Scrivener very basically because I just like to write in there and I'm not big on the planning of digital. Like I like to plan by hand, um, but it's perfect if you like digital planning. So definitely check that out. 
And Janet says, I use index cards. I brainstorm better when I handwrite things and then I can move ideas around to make them work. Yeah, I like that too because sometimes you lay them out on like a table and you can kind of mix them together and move them around and it just makes it easier to make changes. Um, let's see, Julie says, Julie Cohen has a system based on post-it notes in different colors. She has a blog post on it and does workshops in the UK. Cool. Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of people teach this stuff. It's not just Larry. It's not just me. I mean, a lot of people teach it. You're talking, um, you know, Art Holcomb and Cam Weiland and David Vialva. I mean, a lot of us teach the structure stuff and, and the storytelling principles. We teach it in our own way, the way that's resonated for us and the way it's clear to us. Um, and I think that it helps to hear it from multiple people because I think sometimes you just hear one version and maybe it doesn't resonate with you or you don't really take it in as much. But when you hear multiple people's ways of talking about it, it's sort of um, one of the things they say will bring to light on something you've learned previously, but maybe it didn't make sense until you heard their version of it. So for me, I think everything I learned up until 2009 when I found Larry and learned about story structure, everything I had learned up to that point was sort of a jumble in my head. It was sort of like I heard all these different things and learned all this stuff. But when I read Larry's stuff, it really cemented it. It sort of took this like blurry, crazy puzzle that I had and it put all the pieces in the right places and made it clear for me. And that's why his work has resonated so much for me because it just helped me to have clarity on what I need to do specifically. So now that I've understand his version and his way of talking about the things that, again, he he said this yesterday in the in the live stream comments, he didn't make any of this up. So he he didn't make any of this up. This is the way storytelling has always been. It's been talked about like this for a long time, but he has created ways of talking about it that make it easier to understand, therefore easier to implement because that's the biggest problem. It's not learning the craft. It's not understanding it, although that is part of it. But the biggest issue that writers have, I think, is the implementation. So how do I take all of this and actually use it in my own story? And that for me has been um, the reason why I do what I do because I developed my own process for taking this stuff that I learned from him and using it in my own stories. I've developed my own planning development process and how I really figure out my story and put my pieces together. And that's what I teach to people. You know, that's my contribution to um, all of this is that I, I took what I learned from him and then I show people how to use that information and actually create your story from it so that you've got these principles in play. Um, so for me, that was the biggest thing. And now I love when I read stuff from Cam Weiland and from David and all of that because it just brings more clarity, sort of layers in more information about these same things that I've already learned. And that's why I say you got to be committed to being a lifelong student of story because there's always something new to learn. There's always a new way of hearing something or of learning about something that could really bring it clearer to you and, and make it easier for you to really implement it because you understand it better. Um, Jessica, there are several Excel docs online using Larry's method available to download. Yeah, he's got, I mean, plenty of them on his website, tons of them. So um, storyfacts.com, check it out for sure. All right, wrapping this up, we are on our very, very last live stream discussion tomorrow, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, right here back on this page of parts seven and eight in story engineering. So I combined them because the last ones have been a little bit, the last sections are a little bit shorter. So um, I'm going to talk about both of those together. And um, then tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern, Larry and I are hopping on a live call to answer questions, to talk to you guys, whatever you want to do. Um, I will put the call details in the live stream for tomorrow. Um, if you're on my email list, you already got those, and I sent them to Larry so he can share them with his people as well. Um, so yeah, definitely be right back here tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern to check this out. Read parts 7 and 8, and I will see you then. Bye.